So welcome everybody. Um, happy Earth Day to you on this auspicious day. Uh, it's Jiva Mukti's birthday also. So happy birthday to Jiva Mukti. I would like to welcome you once again to another Charter for Change panel discussion. Um, Sharon Gannon is here, founder and creator, co-creator of our beloved Jiva Mukti Yoga Method. And of course, a well-known author, climate change and animal rights activist. Um, and our special guest uh, today is Kip Anderson of Ohm Films. He's the uh, producer of this extraordinary Netflix documentary film called Seaspiracy. Uh, this film shines the light on some very hard to believe inconvenient truths about what we are doing to our oceans by systematically depleting sea life uh, done on an industrial scale, you know, killing off beautiful sea animals fish, the dolphins, the whales, uh, and all so-called bycatch, a staggering consequence of the commercial fishing industry that uses cruel tactics such as trawling to scoop up billions of fish and other animals from the ocean floor uh, with absolutely no regard for what it's doing to the marine ecosystem that sustains life both in the ocean and on land, right? Uh, and obviously it looks like this is coming from this endless demand for fish and fish meal and fish farms. Um, all of this sounds absurd. And if you watch the film, you'll see the staggering numbers and the impact it's, it's having on our life. So, but anyway, to hear, to talk about it more and explain some of the research that went into this is uh, here with us, the producer of Seaspiracy, Kip Anderson. Welcome, Kip. Um, congratulations on this great film. And by the way, Kip is a certified Jiva Mukti teacher, and that makes uh, him also a student of Sharon Gannon. <laughs> so um, welcome again to both of you. Uh, so we have a lot of things to cover. We have an hour and halfway through, we will see if uh, there's any questions or comments from the audience, you know, they will put it in the chat and then we'll pass on some questions to you both. Um, so, um, Caroline, would you show us the first 30 second clip? We want to see it. And then the ocean. it was as the oceans die, the oceans. Die. Um, of course, you know, what it says is the ocean is the one actually playing such a big role to trap the CO2. And then on the other hand, on land, we have all these summits, climate change conferences all over the world. Everybody's talking about fossil fuels. Just now, President Biden just said that he will commit the US to um, reduce emissions by 50% by 2030, I think. And, uh, but nobody's talking about uh, the fact that the oceans are doing most of the job. And I think in one of the clips, it says, we get 85% of oxygen from the oceans. And I'd never heard that. When I saw that, I was shocked. And that's why I wanted to watch the film twice because there's so much educational material. So what do you say to that, Kip? Well, it's something that just, it's kind of, it's been for a long time with the, in, in the environmental movement and, and it, everything is just, the ocean is out of sight, out of mind. It's just, we live on, we're land animals that, that came from the ocean. And just a lot of this information just wasn't, just wasn't, available or it was just no one really you know explained it in 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 a in a way to the mass mass media and then just everybody and it was just ignored i mean i guess that's a simple it was just ignored and it wasn't necessarily you know it's called seaspiracy it's a conspiracy but because it's based on cowspiracy it's kind of a follow-up on that right a lot of it is just ignorance. There's just not that they're covering it up. It's a lot of it. It's just, just most of it. People just did not know this information. And ignorance actually means to ignore. Mm. Ignore. And um, that's what disrespect actually means too. to respect someone or something or some idea means to look at it deeply. Respect means to look and to look again in a, in a deep way. And um, so I'm just head over heels, uh, grateful and thrilled. 
that you have made this film, Kip. Thank you. You're welcome, well, Ali and Lucy. Ali and Lucy, the stars, directors of the show, they really, truly, you know, you see a lot of dangerous moments in that film of them traveling around the world. It was scarier than the film portrays. It was their daring, daring filmmakers, and I'm just very grateful we we're all able to get this story to life, and it's becoming a huge, massive hit, and the ocean movement is really taking off now. And as far as the animal rights movement, uh, you know, fish really finally represented as need be. So it's just, it's a great time. Yes. You know, um, at the teacher training, Kip came up to me, and as many of our viewers know, in our Jiwa Mukti teacher training, we uh, we show lots of animal rights, pro-vegan films, actually two weeks worth of them, and um, very good films, and um, very good films in the way that they actually change people. People, after they graduate, are different and um, not so ignorant. They can't ignore anymore. And Kip came up to me at graduation, and he said, I'm... I'm so grateful that I've taken this month course and thank you for showing all those films. They're really all great and um, impacted my life in a good way, but I think I can make a better one, he said. <laughs> and all due respect to those films, do I have your blessing? And I said, yeah, of course. And um, maybe a year or so later, you got back to me and you said, well, I think I have to make three or four films. <laughs> yeah. That was... So you're, you're on a roll, Kip. <laughs> this is the third one, right? And uh, Third one. Yeah. There could be one more. Let's see. But yeah, it's funny because in Cowspiracy, the first one that most people watching this probably have seen, and then it was What the Health. Cowspiracy was supposed to be one film that was going to do in the environment, and it was going to do health and it was going to do ethics. And then, and, and the first edit actually was, it'd be fun to watch the first edit. We started testing it and people were just like, once it started going into ethics, we're interviewing yogis who actually interviewed it. Uh, um, Jeev Muti. Oh, Giselle. Giselle. Giselle, yeah. Giselle Marie. And, then, and then a Tibetan Buddhist who's right under the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama eats meat, but he doesn't, he's vegan. And it was my favorite part of the film. And as we were testing it, people just kind of got diverted and like, no, this is the favorite part of the film, the ethical part, and it's so interesting. But we realized we can't have health in there. We can't have it, it has to be an environmental film. So like, oh boy, okay, this is gonna be a journey of making several films. Cause even the ocean one, the ocean one in Cowspiracy is only, I think five minutes. And as you can see, each section, you could be an entire film. Oh, so as you said, Sharon, yeah, it was quite the journey of thinking as would be one, but we're, we're, we're on a roll and we're, we're, we're getting there. We're almost finished, so. <laughs> well, as an educator, I feel that, I feel so proud of what you've done. And um, I'm, I feel very uh, grateful being maybe um, behind the scenes or, um, uh, kind of someone that gives blessings for people like you to do magnificent, great work in the world. And I think that that's a very important aspect of yoga is to um, celebrate the amazing things that others do to support each other. And I think in our animal rights movement, we need that each one of us is doing our best to make a difference. And um, I think it's very important not to criticize each other, uh, but to support and to celebrate the work of everybody because it takes all of us together as a community. Like it takes many, like you were just speaking about, it takes many films. You have to make many films to get all aspects of the issue across it takes all of us together and i think this is the time of um as you know the hopi elders say it's a time for community the lone wolf time is gone don't look for 
one person as a savior. We have to work together to create a new way of living, a new way of relating to each other and to the earth. So I'm grateful. I'm just trying to express that to you. Thank you, Kip. Well, you're welcome. And thank you to, uh, like you just said, it's a, it's a thank you to you and, and the support I got. I felt, you know, going into Jiva Mukti Yoga teacher training, I was a vegan about for three or four years prior to that. And I was actually trying to make cowspiracy and I realized I needed, needed the tools. And I, and I, and one of those I felt was being yoga and getting like centered. And, and I remember looking up at that time, I wasn't even doing yoga. I wasn't practicing it. And so around then I studied, okay, what yoga school and what teaching did I want to do? And then of course, I came across Sharon's work and, you know, your history and then Jiva Mukti Yoga. And then that's when I told you, I joined being wanting to be a Jiva Mukti Yoga teacher to align myself with the movement and what I wanted it to do. And, uh, and then, you know, only about, it really worked because only about a year or two after that, after trying to do this for four or five years without the tools of yoga and the, the eight limbs and the way it's taught and specifically in Jiva Mukti, it really, really helped like align myself with the purpose of getting, taking it to that next level of actualizing that dream of, of sharing um, these films with Keegan Kuhn. I just have to mention, like it takes a community. It's Keegan Kuhn. I made those and Allie, and it's a team that did this. So yeah, thank you to everyone. Well, that's kind of my story too. I mean, I was a yoga practitioner before I was a yoga teacher, but I became a yoga teacher because I felt it was a way to bring the message of veganism and animal rights to um, a greater audience. Because like you mentioned, the tools that yoga provides are, whoa, they're powerful, powerful tools. And um, anger and blame, which actually uh, befalls many <clears throat> vegan animal rights activists, Yoga teaches us how to overcome those debilitating forces of anger and blame and to truly be an effective activist. Um, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King discovered those things. Ingrid Newkirk has discovered that truth um, without taking the Jiva Mukti teacher training course. <laughs> but, you know, these are, these are deep and um, important things because I feel the crisis in the world today is a spiritual crisis. I mean, all of the, the environmental, the animal rights, um, all of that really comes down to human beings feeling that the earth belongs to us and feeling disconnected from the earth and not involved in creating a mutually beneficial relationship. And Patanjali says, stira sukham asanam, if you want yoga, if you want enlightenment, if you want to know who you truly are, ultimately, if you want to know God and all these great questions, then your relationship to the earth should be coming from a place of joy and ease. It should be mutually beneficial. It's not all about you. It's about your presence enhancing the earth, your presence enhancing the lives of others. Um, that puts a whole other spin on activism. Yeah. I remember, um, do you, are you familiar with Jim Mason? Of course, yes. Uh, you know, we interviewed him for another project working on and you know, it was interesting that he tells the history of humans People have it's kind of back up. People, oh, I'm in animal rights. I'm in animal rights. Oh, what about the humans? What about the, all these things that humans were? Humans are animals. Like yes. when you say I'm in animal rights, we it's part of us. And so it's interesting if you know he said where this this whole hierarchy of humans above animals and what we need to return to is the moment. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. here's this great, great book. Yeah. Great book. Highly recommend it, reading, and absolutely so, great. And what happened was the moment we revered animals because we were one and you know as equals, and then something happened where we separated ourselves as human beings 
different than, than animals. And what's interesting on that note, it goes two I'm ways. One of where it led us to today. But then another one is where at the time in history did we decide to call ourselves human beings? We could have called ourselves two-legged wise people. We could have been like very egotistical or something. We decided, there's a dog in here. We decided of all names to, to call ourselves what separated us from the other animals was to name ourselves human beings, humane beings. So, you know, he and a couple other people say, you know, now we're aspiring to, to be what we called ourselves a long time ago. But um, what really what took us on this track of that we need to return to is that we separated ourselves from the animal kingdom and we looked at us as separate. And that is what, you know, we're, we need to get back to. We are part of the animal kingdom. So human, the word means close to the earth, from the earth. And so, as you said, um, now we're trying to really say what we mean and mean what we say when we call ourselves human. You know, when you say um, human and humane, one of the most uh, uh, paradoxical things you hear is, oh, let's, uh, oh, we, we slaughter the animals in a humane way, as though that's, that's a wonderful thing or a compliment. And it's... Uh, and actually the humane way is actually horrible because the human beings have always been extremely, uh, extremely violent. <laughs> and, and so that's not helping anyone. But anyway, the language and just the attitude and this is so out of whack. Um, Kip, I wanna ask you a question. So the film uh, coming back to Seaspiracy is full of um, scandals, if you will. I mean, you expose extraordinary layers. There's so many complex things going on the fishing uh, industry, the slavery behind it, the money that comes from it and how people, uh, governments subsidizing it and the taxpayers paying for our own destruction because if sea life is gone, you know, we're paying for you know, the earth to go to hell basically. And this is Earth Day. So um, you know, in your research, for when you, for example, set out to make this film, you, Ali and Lucy, uh, you've done your research and uh, you knew something was here, that something big that people are missing. But when you conducted your investigations and made the film, what was the thing that stood out? Like what shocked you even beyond what you'd already known? I think above everything, everything was the climate the issue, was about how important the, the ocean is to the whole ecosystem of the planet. It's just something that, you know, it just didn't really hit me until these facts started come, pop, popping up and Ali was doing Lucy's tremendous research. And then the real big one is the trolling about, you know, because in Cowspiracy, one of the biggest facts, people cannot believe that an acre per second, I think at the time, which is one soccer field per, that amount of clearing of an acre of, of rainforest, beautiful rainforest over and over and over and over. And that was one of the most shocking things in that entire film. And then to find out in the ocean that is happening at an exponential rate. And I can't remember the exact number, like not even. I have the number. Oh, you I do? Have numbers, yeah. Every year, about 25 million acres of forest are lost. But fishing trawlers wipe out an estimated 3.9 billion acres a year. Those numbers are from the film. It's unbelievable. And I can't remember, we were going to do a comparison about how many Amazon rainforests that was to just, it's just, it's mind boggling. But instead we did, it's like clearing out Australia, uh, England, that we did all those different, it's clearing that entire country out, every piece of it. And that's happening all the time. And, and that was just so shocking. And then to find out how important the carbon sink of that, what is, and it's being ignored by the environmental movement. And as like you said about you know, Biden and about fossil fuels, fossil fuels, fossil fuels. What does that really mean to someone who's listening to this? Is it like, okay, but what am I going to do? You know, and that's why it's an easy thing. Fossil fuels. It's a little bit, it's a little bit abstract to someone who hears this where it's just, this is happening and it's because of eating fish, you know, or this is because of eating animals, you know, for, for the Amazon. It's just a little bit too touchy of a thing. And that's why you can your first question of why we don't hear about this because people don't want to hear something that directly relates to myself where, Oh, 
it's something I might have something to do with. Fossil fuels is more abstract. It's the oil industry or it's some other car. But when it's like, you know, it's my fish consumption, it's a little bit triggering. And, and you know, a lot of these environmental groups are run on, on support of donors uh, of membership and people don't want to hear that. You know, this, this morning, Kip, uh, it hit me, um, this guy, um, Elon Musk, you know, extremely wealthy guy. Everybody knows who he is. He's got a foundation, the Musk Foundation, and they sponsor something called the X Prize. And there is an X Prize out there for $100 million to find the most high tech or the most modern way to remove carbon from the atmosphere, right? $100 million to find a new way of doing it. I'm thinking, after watching this film, I thought, the ocean is actually doing it and, it and it will do it in such an organic, natural way and sort of coming up with some other artificial way of removing carbon. God knows what that's going to do to the climate. And that's the irony we live in, but nobody's talking about the real thing. And, and your solution is right in front of you and you want to create a prize to make up another thing. Anyway, it's, just, it's beyond beyond uh, comprehension. It, it's funny because someone did that a while ago. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio actually produced a film. I can't remember what it was called. I watched it. It was not very good. Um, and it was all about these new technologies of these big, huge wind turbines going into a 40-foot container. And then, and then it's like, wait, there's a thing called a tree that does this. That <laughs> right. has been uh, invented a long time ago. And it's literally a tree is the most amazing carbon sink you can't beat it i mean but so many reasons and then yeah one more level is the sea kelp and the, the kelp forest it's just so mind-boggling amazing. you know one thing kip that i really admire about this film and your other films as well is the step-by-step -step approach that you take the artistry the craft the craftsmanship involved in the sequence that you show the viewer. Like this leads, the, you know, the, in this case, Allie and Lucy, you know, go and interview somebody and then they come across a dead end or a brick wall and this leads them to the next and that leads them to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. It's like swimming <laughs> in the ocean. It's this beautiful kind of artistic, um, almost like a subtle subconscious uh, template that's underneath the film and it it makes the viewer feel the interconnect connectedness of all things um, in a subliminal way this domino effect of how everything is every action does have a reaction that affects everyone so I just want to bring that out that it's um just artistically and spiritually, the film has so much wisdom in that department, mm -hmm. how yeah. it's constructed. Yeah, thank you. That was something, does anyone who's made doc documentaries particularly, it's the editing, who, you know, mm -hmm. the filming, they risked their lives, but then the editing process, that took us, you know, that was uh, something that took four years, three years, because mm -hmm how to connect all these dots. And then when you're editing, you don't know, you know, it's hundreds of hours of footage and then the dots do start to connect and then you weave them together. And then, you know, they follow, they have a hero's journey. You know, you follow the hero's journey, very traditional Joseph Campbell. And that is on purpose, you know, if any filmmaker are interested in storytelling, it's mm -hmm. definitely on purpose. And then how to connect the dots and how to have, but it's quite the, quite the, uh, quite the journey. Um, do you, you have enough uh, outtakes of the film to make five other films, most likely, right? Yeah, and actually, I what just saw Ali. Ali and Lucy are running the Sea Spiracy Instagram page now. And just today, they did a, an outtake of Sylvia Earle. And, you know, Sylvia Earle, what a hero, what a hero. Mm -hmm. And she, her whole interview, we're going to be just, you know, everything she says is, is great of that interview. Mm -hmm. And just today was the first release of something that, uh, a little clip of the interview. So when you follow Seaspiracy's Instagram, mm -hmm. you'll start to see more of these interviews come out and you know, yes. a big part of that. One thing yeah. I love about the film is you continuously go back to the bottom line, vegan. 
stop eating fish. It's not really the plastic, it's not the oil, it's not the fossil fuel, it's the fishing industry. And how can we as individuals do something? Well, stop eating fish. But if we do grasp that, that we must stop eating fish, we also have to include that we have to stop eating other animals because the other animals that, you know, people say, oh, I don't eat fish. Okay, I won't eat fish anymore, uh, but I'm not gonna be a vegan. I'll still eat dairy products and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, as the film does touch on, all of those animals that are raised, all the land animals that are raised for food and including the sea animals, the, the fish in fish farms are fed fish. So if you really say, I'm gonna stop eating fish, that automatically means you will stop eating cows and chickens and pigs and goats, et cetera, because they're all fed fish. And that is something that very few people know about that are ignorant of, but it's in the enriched meal and especially dairy cows. Dairy cows are actually the biggest consumers of fish on the planet, even more than human beings. Dairy cows eat the most fish. It's, it, it's just a Absurd. bizarre. Yeah. So as yogis, you know, many yogis hold on to the dairy as, you know, okay, I can give up meat, but I can't give up dairy. Well, maybe you should, um, I say to that, maybe you should look and look again with the eyes of respect and see how dairy consumption is related to all these other very destructive things that are going on. Yeah. We had actually, you know, these first edits, they're around four hours, the film. So the film could have been four hours. And we consciously wanted to make it around 90. It's very digestible. We had about five to 10 minutes of exactly what you say, Sharon. And it was one of those, we test these and it, it just kind of brought it out a little bit. So we mentioned a little bit, but it was a very important thing that was very difficult to edit out about how much fish consumption is. And as you said, more than anything of dairy cows, but it kind of felt like it started tearing off and it, you know, it's, there's so much in the film already that, you know, stop eating fish. But then if we started really going into this, and then don't eat other animals because of this. It started to, you know, we were testing it out. But that's why the social media, we're going to have all these stories about. It's very important to realize, you know, if you care about the ocean, <laughs> not only don't eat fish, but yes, don't eat dairy, particularly don't eat other animals because it's all interconnected. And, and you had so many uh, extraordinary experts in the film. You actually interviewed so many amazing people. I mean, I was watching it once again. Uh, you know, you have to watch a film like this twice. The first time you just kind of are shocked and you miss a lot and you watch it again, you'll see, oh my God. Uh, you had some amazing people, of course, uh, Sylvia Earle. I mean, she's uh, amazing just when you see her and her life story and extraordinary. You had George Monbiot, you know, that uh, rewilding guy, you know, he spoke really well throughout the film. Um, that, so it took a lot. I mean, how did you guys do that? I mean, you you got some so many people to come and talk, and and that's why it took so long. Yeah, that's why it took so long. A big part is the editing. Editing is who it's it's such a. If you go to our facts page, cspiracy.org facts page, you'll see all the facts. Go to Cowspiracy's fact page. I think it's a around a hundred, and how to tie that and weave, like Sharon is saying, into a film that's coherent and entertaining. Takes long, but then, yeah, these, these edit, uh, a new person would pop up. You have to interview this person. It took a while to interview Sylvia. But what was, you know, kind of, on, I just want to mention the most powerful, you know, after talking to people, I'm not getting fish now to watch it. You know, I always ask them, what, what was it? Or, you know, all the hundred facts. And a lot of them say, interestingly enough, but I kind of felt it when we were finishing, was the Faroe Islands whaler yes. who yes. kills the whales himself. And, he, you know, at that time, you're just like, I can't believe these guys are killing these beautiful whales. And he, it, it's so powerful because he says, OK, 
I'm killing this one whale and I'm feeding 200 people. You watching this, you're judging me. If you eat a salmon, one salmon feeds one person. And, you know, I, a chicken is a chicken's life, a salmon's life. It's all the same. And that's what has done it for a lot of people because they say, I'm not only eating fish, I'm not eating any animal because of what he said. And it's so powerful. We got that, you know, that I remember seeing that for the first time. And I showed and was like, oh, this is so powerful for him to say that. It's he's, my, he's my quite favorite. a character, that Danish whaler. He puts it very frankly and bluntly. And he talks, you know, he talks like a regular guy. So I think he connects with uh, people. I've heard people say, you know, I have more respect for people who go and hunt and actually watch the karma of their consequence than to outsource it to the to sort of the industry where it's done in such large scale and then it comes to you in a shrink wrapped way and you don't even have to worry about all of the slaughter but this guy is actually out there doing and owning it not that what he's doing is great I mean it was just horrific to watch that that is heartbreaking when you see that and the the, the number of uh uh, dolphins killed in France and in Japan and, and all these places, those numbers, it's just heartbreaking. You can't watch it. I mean, it's, it's, oh, anyway. Hey, but listen, um, Caroline has another clip for us. We want to watch it. Uh, interesting stuff. Again, shocking stuff. I want to, we want to see it and then we'll have. Powerful. So the, these are the casualties of war, our war against mother nature. Yeah, you can see how the domino effect, who would think that killing sharks had, would have any effect on seabirds? Like how does that connect? And just the domino effect that it plays. And just a quick side story of Paul who was featured there, who lost his arm and his leg by a shark. And now he devotes his life to protecting sharks. Oh, <laughs> what a story. And, um, I don't know how many years ago it was, but he, you know, as you mentioned, respect Sharon of one of those really, really honoring the truth of what, of, of, of the connection and everything plays together. He, he made the connection. He's vegan as well. Not everyone in the film that we interviewed that's protecting the ocean isn't, but he did, you know, he, he made the connection. He is plant-based vegan, which is, and just what, what a great person he is and a hero for, for all, all, all the beings on this planet. In all levels. Um, so this is a part of, uh, you know, of, of the film that I love very much. The, you know, the numbers and the stats behind it. It's so educational. Uh, I, I hope that this film will be shown in schools. I think a lot of kids should watch it uh, because uh, we need to tell the next generation actually the truth about that. Uh, about what's happening to climate and the earth and where we live and what we do and what's usually hidden behind the scenes with government subsidies. Um, look, in the anti-corruption world, you know, where I, I worked in a number of countries, I've seen uh, billions of dollars stolen from African countries, stashed away in financial centers all over the world. Um, and uh, when you come across a case that's incredible and outrageous, you know, people would say to me, Hari, the world is a messy place. Welcome to the real world. And I see people, even uh, some of the environmental conservationists say that. I mean, you, you put some of them uh, in a difficult position with simple facts and they didn't have an answer. I mean, there's a lot of confusion there um, so my question to you is what, where's this sort of this cognitive, uh, you know, sort of like a dissonance between what they think they're doing versus missing the basic fact. Uh, again, Sharon always has something wise to say from the yoga perspective about, um, you know, is it greed? Is it hubris? Do they like love fish that much that they want to, uh, put blinders on and continue this? I think that is what it is. I think a lot of this is you just have this, you know, this in your rationale, because people just have these spots of just blankness that they just don't go all the way there. 
and it's right there and you're just like, and then you ask these questions and you can't believe they haven't thought about these things, but it's a block because then it, that will trigger subconsciously, they know it or not, it'll block to, oh, I can't eat fish. This fish might be even part of my cultural heritage. It might be something my mother and father taught me. You know, now we're going into something even deeper in ethics of why people even eat animals. It's attacking a belief system. A lot of people think veganism or not eating animals is a belief system. Yet the belief system, is, uh, as, as Melanie Joyce says, is carnism. We were taught to eat animals. A, a child at eight years old was not inherently going to kill a rabbit and eat it. It was taught this belief system that's okay to eat some animals, not. So these things happen and then you kind of get this block of rationale. And until someone kind of penetrates at that with a question or whatever, it's just in there. So a lot of it, a lot of it, especially lower down, if you know the it's not covering it up it's just they just have this block of, of connecting the dots all the way mm. connection is what you know you got you always talk about in yoga um connecting um caroline and i were talking earlier this morning and she said the same thing that they don't see the root and connect the dots uh, and that's why sharon you, you said you started to teach yoga i mean basically to make people see you know, how you even sit on the ground, you know, where we, you know, are on this earth. Um, Hari and Kip, I think I agree with you. It's very important to educate young people, not to keep them away from this, not to continuously uh, reinforce the lies and the deception and um, not to encourage critical thinking not to encourage adventure, not to encourage education, exploration, and uh, seeing for yourself and forming your own opinions. Um, children often, parents and teachers tend to keep them from these facts that are might be disturbing to a child's mind, but ultimately it will disturb the child's mind in a bigger way to be kept from these facts. And um, I, I think, you know, meat eating, uh, exploiting the earth, these are not, this isn't hardwired in us as Kip basically was saying. These are learned behaviors mm -hmm. and that's actually good news because something that is learned can be unlearned can be learned, yeah. okay. with education, with knowledge. And a film like this is providing that for us. And this is such an important film as, and I think it should, I agree with you, Hadi, it should be seen by everyone, regardless of how old they are. It should be shown in schools. Um, it sh but what should be done, what I think should be done, is not necessarily the reality. And that um, is sticky you business. Know, what, one thing that uh, struck me, Kip, you know, of course, we don't want to look at the root cause because we don't have the time. You know, there's so much going on in the world. There's all this news that's flashing on your phones and computers all day. No one has a patience to look beyond the news clip. Uh, the idea that the Somali pirates their entire livelihood was destroyed by commercial fishing. They're these big ships. I read an article again in the New Yorker. They wrote about, I think, off the coast of Gambia um, or Guinea, I forget, uh, huge, same issue. There's large commercial fishing companies from China and other places come and they trawl the ocean. And these poor fishermen have nothing to fish. You know, let's say that's their only form of uh, food. So the idea that these pirates had no other choice, they didn't have anything, their livelihood was destroyed and they now took to this high risk game of uh, hijacking cargo ships and, and holding the crew hostage. I mean, extreme things happen, but nobody looks underneath why these, of course you look at them as, oh, the Somalis are bad guys. You know, They love to go out on the ocean and, and hijack cargo ships and, 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 and use guns and kill people, but you don't look beyond that. And that's, I think, an important type of uh, root cause uh, messaging this film has. 
And also what Kip brings up in the film, well, it's not just Kip, but it's Ali and Lucy. Every, you have a team. Your whole team. You work together, yes. Um, I apologize for not mentioning that, but um, how that those people in Somalia and other African coastal areas then go inland and start hunting oh, bush yeah. meat. And this is the cause of the pandemics that we're experiencing right now, the COVID Ebola and, and Ebola and many of the serious pandemics. So it's, once again, it's this domino effect. It's all interrelated. And I'm so glad that that the film did cover that about the bush meat and um, the connection with the pandemics. Yeah, it's unbelievable, unbelievable how it roots back and it's all these things pirating. How would pirating root back to somehow say killing a shark on the other side of the planet? And like, right. and then, and then you know, and then the that leads to violence of human violence, and it kind of goes you know again. We're working on other projects about wars and these type of things at just surface level they're pirates just robbing other ships it's like well who's the other pirates why are they doing this why are they just and then so often it comes down to killing animals what happens you can have the domino effect of all this just if you remove this remove killing with compassion who like wow what what's more powerful i mean it's just so evident <laughs> so I asked, uh, I think Ingrid last time, the same question. Um, why is it that human beings don't do anything or wake up, even, even when catastrophe hits? Um, sometimes, I mean, look at COVID, right? I mean, it changed life a little bit on the sidelines. We are moaning and complaining about not being able, able to fly here and there um, like we used to. Uh, but but if you look at it, everybody is desperate to go back to normal, what they call normalcy, which is going back to the way it was, you know, with all of the ensuing destruction of the planet and everything else. But when you put these kinds of facts uh, that are shown in the film in front of large um, populations, consumers, um, do you think that there would be some change here? I mean, do you see any, any hope or, um, you know, because if you, if you watch the film, you know, it can be extremely depressing. No, I do actually. And just, uh, it was it yesterday, I had a powerful interview with someone who came out of, we're doing a project with people coming out of life term sentence prison. Uh, and this particular person, he's 77 years old. He was part, uh, he, was in, he was in prison for 34 years. He's been out now for three years before he got out and got into trouble. He was part of the civil rights movement. He was actually at the little rock nine. He was 13 years old and was an activist there. And he was in the activism until he got in trouble and kind of got off the deep end, but he was a civil rights. And now he is again. And I asked him about the black lives matter movement and kind of a question on a different note of, you know, what was this like this world back then in 1984 versus now? And he says, you just can't believe the growth of human beings. Like he's so optimistic because he's like, he went, as he called like Rumpelstiltskin where he goes to sleep and then wakes up and everywhere you look, cause now he, you know, he was vegan for 30 days and the connection to animals, the vegan food, the movements that, you know, animal rights movement he sees now. There wasn't even an animal rights movement in 1984. The gay rights, they're like on and on. And where we're at now, He's just like the growth, if people could recognize that we have come a long way and it is happening and it's inevitable, uh, you know, the light is inevitable. And the Black Lives Matter movement and this, even this film, it's just one more step he sees it in. It's not like taking a step back, it's that we're progressing even further. And so for these films, even when Cowspiracy came out and Seaspiracy, it's like, whoa, this is all happening. It's been happening, it's just no one knew it. Right. So now you have this awakening of information. Now you have, you know, exponential light and growth. So it's just one more step of just having to learn this. Now we all know. And then, boom, now we're coming. Like, I, I, I feel, I don't know, 
I mean, I, I'm an optimist, but I feel the ascension of our, our awakening is happening at such a rapid rate because of the internet, because of the information exchange. And I, you know, I feel we do see it. I feel in, in the animal rights movement, you know, I've been in this animal rights movement for 12, 13 years. And just in the past four to five, finally, it's like, boom, yes, this is what we're waiting for. Sharon, I mean, do you agree? You've been in this longer than I have, and particularly animal rights you probably felt stagnant for a long time and then you start seeing things happening and yeah and actually i, I mean honey when you said uh, the film is depressing in a lot of ways but you know the hard parts in the film we can take those and actually use them as fuel mm -hmm. to move us forward as you know, when, when Kip came to me, uh, you know, some years ago and said at teacher training, I watched all the films you showed. I love them. They were all great. But I think I'm inspired now. I think I can make a better one. So it's not like he discredited what had gone before. He built on that. And that mm -hmm. is, I think, the positive side of seeing so-called depressing or graphic things that the film does show, it has to show that, but you have to see the truth. Then we can build upon that. We can use it as fuel to accelerate us forward. If we keep kindling that hope and that optimism in our hearts, that um, love is real, that kindness is real, that compassion is real, that we can emphasize these things, that our lives can matter. We can make a choice to contribute to enhancing the planet, enhancing the lives of others, or not. That it is really up to us. And as Sylvia Earle sums up, she has the last word in Seaspiracy, which is so amazing to see that strong, powerful, incredible woman give the final message. And she does say that. She says, it's, it's really, it's up to each one of us. Each one of us can do a lot. If there's any message, Kip, to the, um, to the world of environmentalists, activists, um, even all, uh, are basically this huge group of our own Jiva Mukti teachers, um, a lot of them certified recently in the last two, three years. Um, and a, a number of them are activists. You know, they're always looking for inspiration. They always make a difference. That's why they come into the movement. Um, what would you say to them? For example, if I said to you, hey, what organizations should we be supporting? Because uh, I know you've kind of exposed some of the controversies with some of the conservationists in the film. Um, uh, C. Shepherd, obviously one of one of the great ones. Could you think of others, or do you think that's that's a good thing if you want to give money to, for example, because not everybody can uh, be an activist and be on be out on the field. Yeah, C. Shepherd, and also too, just empowering. You know, start your own organization. Like this was just a dream. I did AUM Films right around then, and it was the first two films was literally Keegan and myself. And so pick up a camera, do your own YouTube channel, like make your own, you are your own organization. We live in a time where it had to be these big organizations that you see in the film. And now you can create your own, have, a, have, have a, you know, maybe put some money aside that you don't need much with a camera and a cell phone, your own YouTube channel, and, and, and just raise your voice for those who need it. And, you know, just kind of on the following of the other part you were mentioning is, of inspiration of just really realizing we're at a special time. You know, I remember being, when I went first animal rights and went vegan, it was just see all the negative things that are happening and the animals being killed. But now we're at a time where kind of we're winning, you know, we're, we're the, the side of compassion is finally just, it's got the momentum so strongly that you just now just have to surrender to it. Whereas a long time I felt the first like six, six years of animal rights movement fighting, fighting, fighting to be seen and not as weird as like some extremist. It's, it's happened. And it's so exciting to be part of this movement that you can see we're literally in the middle of this paradigm shift. It's, it's not that it's going to happen. It's happening as we speak. 
and to enjoy it because it's like any big movement, civil rights movement, gay rights movement, women's rights movement, we're in it and, and this movement is all coming together because it's all interconnected. And to just really, uh, you know, really jump on this and just really know like, yay, we're part of this incredible part of history that's happening right now. So it's a really inspiring time, even though sometimes it might think that it might not be so light, but it really is. When you look back, this is the time that we were, that we were waiting for it's right now. To be on the right side of history, or I'd like to say her story as well, our story to be on the right side of our story. Take the gender out of it, the history of the history. It's our story. And um, I, you know, I wrote down some of the words that Sylvia Earle said at the end of the film. Can I read them? Because um, yeah. I think they're just so... Would you like to read that? That would be fantastic, yes. Could yeah. I, I, if I took... Yeah, we're coming no, close to about four minutes. Yeah, we have time. Yeah. Um, so she says, it isn't too late to take the best hope we will ever have of having a home in this universe, to respect what we've got, to protect what remains. Don't let any of the pieces escape. Most of the things that bring about change in human civilization start with someone, someone. And no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. <clears throat> That's what we can do. That's what you can do right now. Look in the mirror, figure it out, go for it. Amen. <laughs> Ashe. <laughs> So, so um, not everybody can make a movie. Not everyone can um, be uh, found a yoga method or whatever, but um, everyone can do something. As they say, activism can always be local, but the impact is global. You know, it's quite wide. Um, so we're getting a lot of messages from our social media channels, uh, people thanking you both for coming to this discussion and congratulating you, Kip, uh, Ali and Lucy and your entire team for making this extraordinary film, opening the eyes. And we hope that a lot of people watch it and actually go to the root of it. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that they're going to reallocate that X prize, $100 million to actually looking at the ocean and doing some shark conservation and going through the whole chain of uh, the domino effect there. Um, so also happy birthday and congratulations to all the Jeevan Muktas all over the world. 1984 to 2021, Jeevan Mukta Yoga is still going strong and spreading in various mysterious ways. Um, so uh, Kip, again, thanks a lot for coming. Sharon, as always, you're so gracious with your time and your blessings to support this. Uh, our Charter for Change uh, is our social justice platform online. We're trying to bring voices across all streams of um, consciousness, animal rights, climate change, um, empowering uh, all genders and, and looking at how we can make the world a better place to live and Jiva Mukti Yoga is a method uh, that uses, um, uh, tries to get enlightenment uh, using compassion for all beings. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for, of course, you, Shannon and Jiva Mukti Yoga and Hari for putting this on. And for the Jivamukti Yoga family, thank you so much for all the support. We're all doing this together. So thank you. We really are. Jai Shri Krishna. Thank you. Jai Shri Krishna.